Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, good evening everyone. Okay, Prof. Abdullah, we can start from you. Yes, uh, Assalamualaikum and good evening Asia, good afternoon Middle East and good morning Africa and Europe. It is my honor and privilege to be a mediator to introduce our great scientists for today with Penner. Before I start, uh, great Dr. Adil, he will start about this with Penner and about the programs. Okay. So can you start, Dr. Adil? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, excuse me, everyone. Can you please uh, pop the or mute all the mic for all? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. This is Adil. I'm a young ambassador of uh, ASM at Malaysia. Uh, our activity for started by November 2020 and is going to continue for another two uh, or three months. Uh, this program is uh, one of the collaboration between American Society of Microbiology and uh, UTHM. Okay, and this uh, just only three minutes to introduce to you what is the ASM and what is the UTHM. So ASM is uh, one of the very old organization. American Society for Microbiology is founded on 1899 around one year, 100 years up to now, and maybe more, yes. And they are working with so many work, so many topics related to the microorganisms or microbiology, including virus, bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, different topics of microbiology, medically, in engineering, in uh, environment, in the food, different aspects of the microbiology. ASM, they have one of the very good uh, memberships. They have more than 50,000 member, members in the organization, and they have one website for all the papers and for all the recent activity in microbiology. You can find all the papers is free to download. You have just to be a member to get the username and password. There are so many types of the membership inside the ASM. One of them is free for the people coming from the developing country like Yemen and Middle East and some of country in, uh, in Africa. For people that they came from Europe or Malaysia developed country, actually they have to pay around $100 per year. So if you want to go in ASM, you have just to visit ASM.org for membership and you can find more details. Okay. Uh, the career so for uh, microbiology is included in the public health or biological safety or in the serum microbiology, academia, governments, so many of the aspects that I mentioned to you. Second part that we do our collaboration with is the UTHM. UTHM is one of the public university in Malaysia, is located on Johor, around 350 kilometers from the capital city. Uh, UTHM have two main campus the uh, campus of Baguio and the main campus. UTHM have more than 10 faculties, including faculty of civil engineering, as we are working on it, and also faculty of science, faculty of electrical, faculty of mechanical, so many of the faculties. If you need to join us in master or PhD program or even degree program, uh, you can find all the information here by using this website. Uh, in the end, uh, I hope all of you that you will get more benefits from our activity. I have to highlight for all participants that this time we produce or generate the certificate automatically. If you are attending more than 20 minutes, definitely you will get uh, your certificate. We have to make more investigation to check uh, or to verify your name, your email, so you will receive all the certificates maybe two or three days after the activity. Thank you so much, Prof. Abdullah, to give me this chance. And uh, I think the mic again to you. Thank you for all. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Adel, for this introduction about uh, uh, American Association and UTM. And uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, I want to introduce uh, our distinguished guest uh, for today' webinar. Uh, before I announce the name. I want to say a few words or a small CV of our uh, guest speaker. is Associate Professor at Thrift Clay Institute of Pharmacy and Biomedical Science, Thrift Clay uh, University, UK. Currently, she uh, head the Natural of Products Metabolomics uh, Groups, NPMG and is currently author of more than 160 publications and two patents on the topic of marine natural product. She refers articles on marine natural products on more than 10 peer reviewal journals and is a member of editorial board for marine drugs. Her expertise, uh, both in natural product isolation and structural elucidation, and modern spectroscopic techniques. At present, she has a series of ongoing projects on the application of metabolites to identify and biotechnological optimize the production of bioactive secondary metabolites in marine derived microorganisms. Her educational qualification start from Bachelor of Science degree in 1998-95 in Industrial Pharmacy, University of Philippines. In 1992, she finished her Master of Science degree in Pharmacy in University of Philippines. In 1998, she finished her PhD in Pharmaceutical Biology in Jolis uh, Maximilian University uh, Orzenberg, Germany, and her employment history in 1987 to 1993, University of Philippines as a research uh, assistant and lecturer. In 1998 until 1999, University of Oklahoma, research fellow in the United States. In 1999 and 2001, University of California, Sand Cross Research Fellow. In 2001 to 2007, it's the uh, University of Düsseldorf Research Fellow in Germany. In 2005 to 2007, in Düsseldorf Life Science Center. In 2007 to 2000, 2010, University of Stretch Clade Lecturer Grade, a research scientist part-time, then after that, from 2010-2015, also lecture grade B, then 2015 until now, University of Stuttgart Senior Lecture and Associate Professor. Her grant, more than 15 grants, from 2017 until, uh, from 2000, sorry, from 2000, uh, I think uh, from 2012, uh, 10 to 12, and, and others with different grants, more than 15 grants. Uh, she taken recently, she have to, from November 2017 to March 2018 for marine, marine biopolymers. For the academic quantitative indicators, she published one box, Publication in journals with selective editorial policy 161, uh, articles, book chapters 8, patents 2, supervisor of master student 54, supervisor of doctoral thesis 15, numbers of citations, the uh, submission of the time citation 4859. The submission of citation of self citation 4,657, 
and cite articles 4028, her H index 39, and her education external accreditation team in 2012, external examiner in different doctoral and master student in different university, especially in Europe and other uh, universities. Editorial review, peer review for uh, many journals, referee in many journals in Marine Drug Journal of Natural Products uh, and other type of journals. Editorial board members for marine drugs in open access uh, journals and also guest editor for marine from 2014-2015. Uh, conference, she, she, she chaired many uh, and organized many conference in 2015 in her university and also invited speaker in different uh, and scientists committee and chair in different conference. Professionals body membership, member of society of chemical industry, member of Stretchfield. Uh, for Scotland in 2015-2016, member of British Mass Spectrum uh, Spectrometry Society, and also American Society of Pharmacogenesis and member of policy and legal experts. So we have today, uh, it's my, as I said, it's my honor and pleasure to be uh, as uh, one of the uh, lucky, uh, I mean, uh, doctor, which introduced our uh, speakers today. Uh, welcome all of us. We welcome you, Dr. Associate Professor uh, Rangi Angeli uh, Edrad Abel, Stretch Institute, Stretch uh, Clade Institute for Pharmacy and Biomedical Science. Can you start now, Prof, to introduce and to present your uh, web panel? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Almaty. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, it's all right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So for this afternoon or evening in Malaysia, or I don't know, good morning to the entire world, uh, good afternoon and good evening. So our web webinar would be on secondary metabolomics. So it's actually in literature, it could also be described as natural products metabolomics. So for this seminar, I would introduce on how we use a metabolomics approach to be able to ta target to bioactive metabolites um, in doing natural products research. Hence my title, targeting the bioactives from a haystack. Okay, so the Natural Product Metabolomics Research Group was established, or I founded it in the year 2009. That was just after I transferred in uh, the University of Strathclyde from Germany. So to Bro, date... The, the, the slides does not appear in the... Oh, it doesn't appear. Could, all yes. right. Can you share the, the floor, please? I allow you to share if you want. Okay, <laughs> of course I want. <laughs> okay, yes. could you see my screen now? Yes, definitely, we can see it now. All right, good, thank you. Yeah, so the Natural Products Metabolomic Groups was founded in 2009, and that was just after I moved to University of Strathclyde. So to date, we've already have 18 PhD graduating from the group, and with the help of um, nine research fellows, um, the uh, NPMG is still very much alive into research these days. So. Of course, um, we owe this to our collaborative or co collaboration with a different university, not only in Europe, but globally. So we've got 
very close collaboration, for example, uh, with University College Cork in Ireland, Würzburg in Germany, Bangor in Wales, we've got Griffith University in Australia. A very recent collaboration is uh, University of Pepignon in France, then we've got Brazil, Sao Paulo, and of course in Malaysia, we've got very close collaboration with VK, UKM and UMT. Part of this collaborative work is it's also very important that we work closely with small medium enterprises, not only in Scotland that involves marine biopolymers and bioactives, but also in Europe like Pharmac from Norway and Matis from Iceland. And these collaboration will of course not also be possible if we don't have funding. So most of our funding, we get it from uh, UK Research Council and the EU also plays a very important role in our research. So most of our uh, international Erasmus students from Europe are funded by the European Commission. Okay, so the main objective of our research is to, do, to use a metabolomics approach and do the, the replications, algorithms, and strategies in doing natural products research. So the type of materials we're using is we work a lot on microbes and that involves both bacteria as well as fungi. Um, when it comes to fungi, most of our work is coming from endophytics or endophytes from uh, medicinal plants or um, seaweeds, so which means we always go back to our marine resources as well as mangrove plants. A lot of our bacteria that we're working with are coming from sponge associated um, environment. Okay, and these sponges are collected from the northern part of Scotland, Iceland, so it's more of the uh, polar regions. But we do also tackle um, uh, materials coming from the Mediterranean, particularly those of geothermal environment. So we've been training scientists uh, internationally. So as you see this map, so we've got very close um, training workshops or collaborations with uh, Mexico, Colombia, and uh, Brazil. And going back to Europe, of course, we've got Germany, France, Norway, and Iceland. And in the Middle East, we've got, we just started the collab collaboration in Saudi Arabia, a long collaboration with Jordan. And in Africa, we've got uh, Egypt and Nigeria. And going back to Asia, we've got collaboration in India, Beijing, of course, Malaysia, Australia, and Indonesia. So when we started C Biotech in 2012, okay, we established a consortium which is composed of 80% industrial lead, yeah, which means all our materials are being tested by industrial partners from Italy, Iceland, and Norway. Right. But the most important objective of our project was to be able to scale up the uh, microorganisms that were found to be bioactive, which means we have a very important collaboration with a biotechnology group in Scotland called Ingensa. Okay. So this project involves a lot of scientists. It's multidisciplinary, it involves pharmacology, molecular biology, biotechnology, collaborating with ASK chemists, okay? And of course, we also have the metabol metabolic engineering group. So research and technological de development, we do follow this workflow. So this could also be applied to plants, so not only with microorganisms. Of course, we start our isolation and culturing from our different resources, and then we go into extraction and our extractions are subjected to metabolomic analysis. So here we start with chemistry and basically we do both uh, mass spectrometry and NMR. But in parallel to this, we do a lot of, uh, we do work a lot with uh, molecular biology to do the genome mining data for us. And of course, again, most important is that we do want to work with bioactive components. So 
the role of the pharmacologist is also important when it comes to bioassay screening. So what are the challenges in working in this type of work? So first thing is, this is our main objective, new compounds, new bioactivity, 100% novelty. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we do get known compounds, but new bioactivity, which new mode of actions, and we've got 50% novelty. This is not so bad because then when you're working with the industry, the most important thing for them is that we do gain bioactive components. A third scenario is that we've got new compounds, but no bioactivity. This is quite a challenge when it comes to publication because these days it's more difficult to uh, publish when your compounds doesn't have bioactivity. However, this could be compounds that is typically interesting for academics, particularly when it comes to chemistry. So in some ways, we do know that these compounds do have their function within a cell. So there should be some bioactivity, which could still be discovered. A big no-no scenario is known compounds and known bioactivity where we don't get any novelty at all. If this is the case, then I think we need to make a quick decision to stop the research and go to the next one. So we think with all these challenges, the best way really to solve this is to do a metabolomics approach. So what is metabolomics? So metabolomics is the systematic study of unique chemical fingerprints that is a result of a specific cellular process. And these cellular process is collated and starts really from a biological cell. It goes up to a higher system called tissue, organs, and finally, we've got then the entire organism. So basically what we are analyzing in metabolomics are the end products of a so-called cellular process. So how do we apply the metabolomics approach as a tool in drug discovery? As I've said, it could be called in the literature as natural products metabolomics or secondary metabolomics. So these are the objectives or what is the process really involved in, met in a metabolomics approach. First, macros are embedded within a natural product database to enable a very efficient and rapid replication. This is important because you want to work with novel metabolites, okay? And second is to use multivariate analysis to investigate patterns in data. And this will answer four objectives. First, to use it as a selection tool to be able to work with the best plant or microbial strain, okay? And we could only do this if we could determine the chemical novelty, hence the replication. Second, um, I think I'm being interrupted. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. You can continue, please. Uh, can you? Yes, yes, he's a mute. All right, okay, good. And the second is, um, it's also used to optimize process conditions, especially if you're doing fermentation work. So you want to optimize your parameters, right? And that's only when you're doing uh, fermentation work, but for example, you're harvesting plants. So you want to know what is the optimum harvest conditions. Third, very important is to investigate bioactivity. So with multivariate analysis, we are able to compare chemical profiles between bioactive and inactive extract. And lastly, is to integrate our data with genomic data and to be able to confirm the expression of a biosynthetic gene clusters. And in this way, we, are, could, we could further investigate and optimize the biosynthetic pathway. So Okay, so we did start using metabolomics because we have to deal with this really large challenge of, or big challenge of um, analyzing a large number of uh, raw materials. So this was a pilot project and we were faced with 300 microorganisms. 
And in one week time, we have to make a decision which strain will be the best to scale up. So we did three things. So we did NMR mass spectrometry and a bioassay. And from there, we are able, so using a metabolomics approach by multivariate analysis, we were able to come up with this plot. And in this plot, it was telling us these dots here represent the different extract from different microorganisms or strains. So we could now determine which microorganisms are considered to be unique in terms of chemistry because they are away from the cluster as well as we also could determine whether they are bioactive or not. Okay, so with the bioactivity, so those triangles there, squares, circles, and asterisks, they do represent certain bioactivity for these unique, meta, uh, unique strains giving uh, novelty in terms of chemistry. So which means in one week or two weeks time, we are we're able to make a decision which strains will need to be further scaled up. Okay, so the analytical platform we're using were both mass spectrometry and NMR spectroscopy. And the reason behind that is because we want to use the advantages of both platforms. So we know that an NMR spectroscopy is a very reproducible platform, okay? Which means it really doesn't matter when and where you do your measurements, you do get the same type of spectrum, okay? The only disadvantage of using NMR spectroscopy is that the sensitivity. We are only able to see metabolites at microgram level. When it comes to mass spectrometry, this is a very sensitive analytical platform, which means we could see metabolites or detect me metabolites down at picogram levels. Okay. The only disadvantage of mass spectrometry is that it's very dependent on the ionization capability of the metabolites. And not all metabolites will ionize in the same mass analyzer. Okay. So unlike you could have a sample or a metabolite at very high concentration, but still, if it's not detectable by mass spectrometry, then that platform becomes a disadvantage. And that's the reason we do use both, because in NMR, the compounds could be detected irregardless of the capability of these metabolites to be ionized or not. So the challenges of an omics data. First challenge we had was that, of course, you have to expect a complex set of data, whether they're detectable or not, if you're using two platforms. Okay. In mass spectrometry and NMR experiments, you could get hundreds or thousands of features. Okay. So for mass spectrometry, that's the mass over charge ratio. In NMR, you've got the chemical shifts. We usually need to deal with large number of samples, 50 to 100 or even greater than 100. And these are called observations. And each observation could give you multiple features. So just imagine if you're already dealing with 100 samples and you get multiple features for each observation, then you are dealing with thousands of features. Okay? represented by their mass over charge ratio or chemical shifts. And these are called variables. The next thing that we need to solve is to be able to separate the noise from real data without losing any information. So the main question is how do we extract this useful information? And we need to find underlying trends or called latent variables. And these latent variables is the one that would answer certain problems in an experimental question. So for example, uh, one sample question is, is the increase of metabolites dependent on the temperate, different te temperatures of the inoculation or the fermentation parameter? So those are underlying trains that could be explained using the latent variables. And finally, we need to get a stable model. 
So to be able to satisfy all these challenges, the only way to do this is to use multivariate analysis. So these would allow, to ex allow us to extract information from the data using multiple variables. So considering all the different variables simultaneously, then we are able to separate noise from important data without losing any information. So again, the answer to that is multivariate analysis. So what we're going to do for the rest of my seminar is I'm going to show you different cases, how we apply multivariate analysis to be able to make decisions in isolation of the bioactive metabolite. So this is our predefined metabolomics workflow. We usually start with mass spectrometry. We use both positive and negative ionization mode because as I've said, not all metabolites will ionize on the same mass analyzer or ionization mode. Then we process our data. So we do de-isotoping de and alignment. And here at this stage, we could do formula prediction. Once we have that, then we could transfer our data for the replication. So this step is important because then we are interested in looking into novel metabolites. So with the replication, we are able to see the known, both the known metabolites and to target the new metabolites. Once we have this, then we collect our other data sets from NMR and bioassay, put them into multivariate analysis and try to find correlations between chemistry and bioactivity, as well as the production of biosynthetic, new biosynthetic genes. So we do that everything in multivariate analysis. Multivariate analysis will also answer the question, what is the best fermentation method when we're dealing with different microorganisms? So once we have made the decision here, which strain we're going to further scale up or further isolation work, then we could now do our structure search and finally elucidate our bioactive metabolites. So that is our metabolomics workflow. So as examples, there will be three application projects that I will present. The first one is an example of a dereplication de strate strategy for targeted isolation of new metabolites. The second one is a metabolomics guided isolation of bioactive compounds. And the third example is defining selectivity of bioactive metabolites. So here's the first example. So this is a dereplication strategy, strategy for a targeted isolation of new antitrypanosomals, actinosporines, from a marine sponge associated actinokinospora. So actinokinospora is a type of actinomycetes, okay? And it was derived from a marine sponge. So, what we find here are two types of multivariate analysis plot. On the left is the so-called score plots. And these dots here represents the different extracts. So on the left of the plot, the left two quadrants represents the active extracts. And on the right represents the inactive extract. So as we will see here, the ethyl acetate extracts were found to be active and the methanolic extracts were found to be inactive. Now, we use three types of media. We use the alginate beads, ISP2 broth, and XAD. For the ethyl acetate extract, because they are, the dots are close to each other, then we could say that the chemistry are very much similar are identical to each other. However, in the methanolic extract, you can see that the, ex, that the chemistry are more diverse. So here we've got the alginate beads, XAD, and here the liquid broth. So which means these three extracts, there are some kind of differences when you compare them to the ethyl acetate extract. When we do the S plots, so what you see here, these dots here represents the individual metabolites represented by the two quadrants. 
So here on the right quadrant, those are the methanolic extract and the left quadrants are the ethyl acetate. So the main objective is to be able to target these metabolites here, which are responsible for the bioactivity. When we did the dereplication, so here, what you see here is a total ion chromatogram. The blue was measured, the blue line was measured from the negative mode and the red line was measured on the positive mode in mass spectrometry. So what does this tell us? So it tells us that both modes are important. If we did the measurement only in the positive mode, then we will not be able to see or detect all these different metabolites. So which means the most important metabolites, which are actually represented by anthraquinones and phenolics, are only detectable in the negative mode. So here, my take home message, it is really very important to use both modes. If you only use one mode, if we only use positive mode, then we will not be able to see these metabolites. So our first hypothesis will now state that the bioactive metabolites belonging to the ethyl acetate are made up of anthraquinones. So here to compare our, HR, our mass spectrometry data with our NMR data. Again, we have the active and the inactive. The great advantage of working with NMR is that it gives us an idea what type of metabolites we are working with. Although the dereplication data already told us that we are dealing with anthraquinones, we still need to confirm that. We need to have some validation. So NMR is a good analytical platform to do that. So we could see here that the blues, this is the NMR data. So the lines are concentrated between three to six ppm or five ppm. And that is representative of sugar molecules. And that explains to us already why the methanolic extracts were inactive. If you look at the active extracts, we can see that there are signals in the aromatic regions, which are typical for phenolics and anthraquinones, as well as we could still see some sugar signals here, which tells us that the anthraquinones could be glycosidic in nature. Now, regarding what is the best media, we could also see that from the NMR. So here, for example, we see all these triangles in the aromatic region that represents the bioactive metabolites. And this actually co correlates with the um, alginate beads in ethyl acetate, so as you would see here, okay? So which means that in that way, we could make a decision that our scale up should involve the alginate beads as our chosen media. So here's the S plot again. So we did the fractionation and also compare the different extracts between the media. So just to validate which is the best media. So for example, we have here ISP2 growth and ISP2 agar. So this was already done during the scale up and we've already defined our target as this molecule with a molecular weight of 611. And we could see that its presence is higher in the ISP2 broth than in the ISP2 agar. That was also validated by our MSET mine um, procedure. So here's the ISP2 broth. We could spot the 611 molecular weight on the side of the ISP2 broth, which we could not find in the ISP2 agar. When it comes to alginate beads, there is a higher concentration of the 611 peak that was also observed in the uh, diagonal plot from the MSET mine. And still we cannot see it in the ISP2 agar. But in, when we use XAD, there was a total disappearance of our 611 peak. And you can see here, it's very near to the zero line. We could detect it in the ISP2 agar, but in a very minute or diluted concentration, yeah? And the same thing here on the MSET mine analysis. So here is the diagonal plot, okay? There is really a total disappearance or loss of the 611 peak. We could see 
a small concentration in the ISP2 agar. So let's go to the second project. So this is to tell us a metabolomics guided isolation of again antitrypanosomal compounds from an endophytic fungi, okay, of a mangrove plant called Avicenna lanata. So this mangrove plant was collected and along the coastline of Terengganu. So this was done by a PhD, uh, Malaysian PhD student of mine, Dr. Weenie. Okay. So we started collecting roots and twigs, okay, or Winnie started the collection of roots and twigs and brought it over to Strathclyde, isolated seven fungi, okay, and among the seven isolates, three were bioactive. But for this seminar, I'm going to proceed only on uh, Fusarium and Lacidiplodia. Okay. She did molecular work to identify the different strains and did optimization of the chosen strains by uh, rice and liquid media using 7, 15, and 30 days. And then from there, she did the replication studies and then match it with the results of the bio screening before doing the scale up. So in this scale up, the main question Winnie needs to answer is what is the best media to use to be able to isolate a high yield of the bioactive metabolites? Once she has determined that, then she do the isolation and purification, and then finally the elucidation of these metabolites. So this is the result now, okay? So on top here, we've got the Fusarium, and down here, we've got the Lacidiplodia, okay? From the yield, we could see that the highest yield were obtained from the rice culture, from both the 15 days and 30 days, but highest really could be found in the 30 days. She also get very good bioactivity, okay, at 0 0.1 and 2.9% uh, growth of the... Um... Oh, Can you sorry. Mute, please? <laughs> Can you still hear me or you could only hear the music? I think someone is playing music. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So these two were found to be bioactive, right? But I think the most stable bioactivity was found in the 15 days. When it comes to Lacidiplodia, we could see that the hard, uh, highest yield were found in the liquid culture 30 days, and then followed by 30 days, 15 days under the rice culture. However, when it comes to bioactivity, there was a unique bioactivity found on the 15 days. That, this tells us that increasing the yield doesn't really increase the bioactivity. And that also tells us the type of metabolites being used or being produced are very different in the different type of cultures. Okay, so here is the metabolomics or multivariate analysis. So on the right side are the active metabolites and on the left are the inactive. But let's focus our attention on the active extracts. So here, we could see the uniqueness of the Lacidiplodia rice culture 15 days, okay? So that already correlates with that result. So here, this is then the S plot. It tells us the different metabolites that Norwini will need to target. When looking at the uh, score plot again, using the principal component analysis. When we say principal component analysis, we do not group them according to activity or we don't use any groupings. We just look at them according to their chemistry. And here we could see the uniqueness of the Lacidiplodia extract and the liquid culture 30 days, as well as the rice culture 15 days and 30 days. However, the other sets of extracts seems to be quite related in terms of their chemistry. Now to see that or make it, to visualize that properly, we did a heat map. 
Okay, and we can see here for the fusarium, okay, there is actually a very good diversity for the 15 days culture. Going to Lacidiplodia, okay, we would say, oh, the best diversity is really on the 30 days culture. However, as we said, because the 30 days cultures are not active, then Norwini will need to turn her um, focus on the rice culture 15 days. So she did the scale up for the Lacidiplodia on the 15 days culture, as well as for the Fusarium. Instead of choosing the 30 days culture, okay, she chose the 15 days cultures because of its diversity in terms of chemistry. Okay, so here is the fractionation then. Here's the total ion chromatogram. As you would see, if you compare the approach using just your total ion chromatogram versus the metabolomics approach, the metabolomics approach, we are able to define the targets. But it is not necessary that these targets will be the metabolites with highest intensity. So you would see here the major metabolite will be metabolite number 19, 20, and 22. But the bioactive metabolites are actually these small peaks here, okay? And that is something interesting. So if we did it to a metabolomics approach, so Norwin could have targeted this and we would end up with the inactive metabolites because the actual bioactives are actually concentrated here and they are the lower intensity metabolites. So here we've got the different fractions. So we have the inactive fractions here as well as the active metabolites, oh, sorry, active fractions on the left. These were quite unique and they could also be characterized by these metabolites here. The problem in doing a metabolomics approach, okay, or the limitation is that although we could target these metabolites, the question is, are we able to isolate them? In this case, Norwini were not able to isolate this because of their very low yield. So which means she could then focus on these fractions represented by fractions four, eight, and 11, where they have a larger yield to be able to isolate these active metabolites. And these were the metab metabolites that she isolated. So with molecular weights of 291, 289, and 287. She was not able to isolate 305, 347 because of their very low yield. So let's go to Lacidiplodia. So again, using the same type of analogy. So here we've got the active metabolites and the inactive. And here are the different um, features. So again, active extracts versus inactive extracts. And here on the right side, these are the features that represent the active extract. And here on the left quadrants, are the features or metabolite that represents the inactive extract. So we have to focus our attention on these metabolites representing the active extract. And as we locate that on the total ion chromatogram, we landed on the same problem. So we could see here, okay, that these metabolites here are of lower intensity. So no, we need to focus our attention on these metabolites rather on this major metabolite. And later she found out that that is the compound, among the compounds responsible for the bioactivity. So these are the compounds that Nurwini were able to isolate and she was really had very good result. So we compared the compounds with suramine so suramine is the standard drug used against trypanosoma. So it has an IC50 of 0 0.71. So most of the compounds are relatively comparable, but the best one is solaniol. So it was even more active against suramine. So it has an IC50 of 0 0.047 microgram per mil. And the best news is if we look at the selectivity index, 
it is even, it has a very high selectivity index in comparison to ceramine. We all know that ceramine is a very toxic drug. So it's a very toxic drug even to normal cells. And we could reflect that on the very low selectivity index, which means we have here a drug which has a very good potential to use against trypanosomes, okay? So let's go to the final project, defining selectivity of bioactive metabolites. So here, um, Ahmed, um, he was a PhD student from Egypt. He was working on um, indigenous medicinal plants from Egypt. So he isolated an endophyte. It's an Aspergillus aculeatus. And he was interested in looking into the anti-cancer compounds. So she first started with two types of culture, the liquid culture and the rice culture. And we could see that the NMR spectrum are, were already quite different between the two. Yeah. So our question is, which are the more important uh, culture? Is it the rice culture, the liquid culture? So she also, he also did a mass spectrometry data analysis. So here we could see in the mass spectrometry data that we really have more uh, metabolites being produced in the rice culture when you compare it to the liquid culture. So there are less dots or metabolites observed in the liquid culture. So here's the total ion chromatogram. So the blue lines represents the rice culture and the red lines represent the liquid culture. So here we could really make a quick decision, say, okay, we go for the rice culture. But the question is bioactivity. So doing the bioactivity results, we could also see that the rice culture indeed give very good bioactivity. And that is the seven days culture and the 15 day cultures, both of them were active against leukemia cell lines. However, when it comes to prostate cancer, the, um, we only found the seven days rice culture to be active. And that tells us that the 15 day rice culture is specific only on leukemia cell lines. Looking at the uh, multivariate analysis data, so here we've got the rice culture data. Okay, for seven days. And these are the metabolites that represent the extract for the rice culture. So that's quite interesting. So Ahmed decided to look into this. The great advantage working with seven days culture is that industrially it's more viable because it's quick. Second, his argument was that we've got here dual bioactivity. It's not specific, but it's dual between leukemia cell lines and uh, prostate cancer cell lines. So we investigated that. Going to the next slide. We also did a separation of extracts that were active against the prostate cancer cell line and extracts only active against the leukemia cell line. And the objective of doing this is to pinpoint the metabolites responsible for those bioactivities. So we could see here for the cancer cell line, the main compound responsible for the bioactivity is the dinaptofuran dione. It is only specific for the activity against the prostate cancer cell line. When it comes to the leukemia cell line, we've got this. We've got secalonic acid, citric acid, and this diketopiperazine compound. My first argument, citric acid, that cannot be bioactive. No way that will be bioactive. But in this case, citric acid came into the bioactive side of the metabolomic plot because during the production of secalonic acid, we also have the citric acid as a biomarker. And that means that citric acid becomes a biomarker every time secalonic acid is being produced. And the great advantage of that in biotechnology or fermentation work, it is easier to detect citric acid indirectly to be able to say that we have the increased production of secalonic acid. So secalonic acid is a larger molecule and it's more difficult to detect. Usually, for example, you're using IR as a detector probe in biotechnology or fermentation tanks, yeah? And I think it's easier to 
um, detect the citric acid when calibrating these types of probes. So here's again a validation plot. So we could see again on top are the bioactive compounds or extract. And here we've got the inactive extract. And we could see the type of compounds being produced in the active extracts or fractions. So here we've got the dikitopiperacin, we've got the dinito, dinaptofuran, and secalonic acid, and again the citric acid. So the occurrence of citric acid has nothing to do with bioactivity in this case, but it is correlated with the production of this large molecule secalonic acid. So let's go to the conclusion. So that means, okay, doing the metabolomic approach, we've got here actually a maze system. But then when tackling natural products research, okay, the best way is really to go on target. We don't want to get road and traffic signals that are confusing. And we don't want to end in a signal saying, wrong way, go back. Okay? So we do believe that using a metabolomic approach helps us to go into our targets, okay? rather than following wrong signs or traffic signs in this case. So finally, I would like you to thank. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. So, if there's any questions, so I think we are open to that, and do we still have enough time to do that? Okay, Hello? thank you very much, Prof. It's um, really wow. I mean, the project and also the different type of. Uh, secondary metabolism and uh, metabolomic uh, started from, uh, for example, from actinomyces, from marine, and bio, uh, for example, ethanol, and also bioethanol, bioethanol and bioethanol. Then after that, you go for another uh, microbes like uh, spirogelis and also uh, uh, some type of microorganism like uh, the marine uh, fungi and you produce different also drugs then the last one with the project in egypt about the uh, anti-cancer drug uh, produced from espergillus uh, really it's uh, we travel with you in different country with the different also uh, i mean microbes and different uh, metabolomic. So now we'll start with the uh, question. Uh, and in the beginning, I want to uh, introduce or I want to welcome to Dr. Muhammad Shukri, uh, your student. Uh, he's presenting today. And also, I welcome our deputy dean, uh, our deputy dean of uh, Faculty of Medicine. Prof. Zarina, and also I welcome professor from uh, King Abdulaziz University. So um, I think uh, two of them or three of them, they are you, your student. So uh, uh, anyone want to ask any question? Let me see that. Uh, I think there's one question here. Uh, from the chat, it says, how to calculate IC50? Okay, Prof. Yeah. So by definition, IC50 is where in you get the concentration that you're able to detect 50% inhibition. Okay. So which means you need to try different concentration. You can start from nanograms to microgram level. Okay. It depends what is the... Uh, bioactivity of your or potency of your extract or you could also start from a microgram level to a milligram level and just detect where you get 50 percent inhibition and that is your ic50 okay that's one question any more question okay uh, prof, i want to ask one question yes regarding the, um, the first project which you, you uh, see it in the uh, for example, rhodococci and fib, uh, fibro, uh, fibrobacilli and uh, bacillus. 
uh, this uh, project you do it in the north, is it? In the uh, Atractica area or something. So you deal with the alkalophilic and uh, cyclophilic bacteria, is it? Yes, yeah, so what we do is that um, we realize that some of those bacteria, they don't grow at higher temperatures. They yes. just, yeah, they just, <laughs> they, we ju they just, yeah, they just, yeah, we just can't grow them. So we usually grow them at around 17 degrees centigrade. So I think that was the optimum temperature that we could grow. grow. Yes. However, there are also some very stable bacteria that could grow at higher temperatures, so 24 degrees or uh, 30 degrees, but 30 degrees is already quite difficult to grow this bacteria. Mm -hmm. So optimum will be 17 to 24 degrees. Um, regarding, what was the other question? Sorry. Regarding the NMR and also the other uh, uh, method which you used, you use NMR to identify the uh, hydrogen and carbon, is it? From the compounds? Yes, right. So we just try to validate what we have in the dereplication data. So for example, in the, in the first example I showed you, we're seeing anthraquinones nodes from the dereplication. When we do the replication is that we match it to a database. So the question is, is it real what we're seeing? So then we look at the NMR data and if we are supposed to see anthraquinones, then we need to see signals in the aromatic regions in terms of their proteins. We only use proton NMR, we don't use carbon NMR because um, proton NMR are quick to measure and carbon NMR is not possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, other question? For, for me, I have a question, Doctor. Yes, yes. Doctor uh, Mohamed. For many, of, yeah, yes. for many optimization, you do it manually or using the surface methodology or how you do the media optimization? Manual methods or using the systematics or mathematics methods? Wait, you're being cut at the moment. And so how do we do the optimization? Is your question, right? Yeah, so yeah, so they try different media. Okay, it depends on the type they're working with, if it's a fungi or uh, a bacteria. And they just try to find out where the bioactivity could be improved or not. So that's the first question. Second is to improve the diversity of the chemistry that they're looking at. Okay, but basically bioactivity is the most important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Prof. Abdullah, there is some uh, participants, they want to ask the... Uh shake their hand. You can see from the participant list. Prof? Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Ruen. Hi, Shukri. Hi, Ruen. How are you? Good. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I, I have a question, okay? Uh, uh, could, you, could you advise us, okay? What do you advise in terms of uh, transportation media throughout more than 12 hours flying? Uh, uh, to be brought to your lab, if I have a sample from Malaysia, to mm -hmm. go to your lab. Okay, so what would you advise in terms of transportation medium? So I would advise to put it in test tubes and then okay. glycerol on top. Do you know those? Ah, so yeah, if you yeah, have, okay. yeah, so you could do a, a bro, uh, an agar media, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you inoculate them with your um, strain and then on top, okay. you put glycerol. Okay. All okay. right. So it, it will last course, uh, for about um, how many hours if I ever try to fly with a uh, flight? Uh, because my, from Malaysia to go to your lab is about 12 hours, I think, more than 12 right. hours. Right. So the uh, only <laughs> problem will be the six hours, I think, from Malaysia to Dubai. Because, but mm -hmm. when you're flying anyway, it's cold um, mm -hmm. above. I don't know how many altitude you're flying. So it's really cold. So it's not really, it's only one landing. So, okay. yeah. So when you, for example, land in Dubai and mm -hmm. it's quite hot, mm. then your samples would be exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the best way really for students coming from, from, for example, my students coming from Saudi Arabia and Brazil is that they send their samples by courier. 
Ah, okay. So it's quicker. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. 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 All I got right. it. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. And you could also, if you send it in Korea, you could also send it in, I think, ice. Well, it doesn't, ah. I don't know if dry ice is allowed. I don't think dry ice is allowed. But no, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I think you could put it in Star Report to, to at least. Uh, okay. Thank you. And I got your point. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Hello, Prof. Hi. Hello, Prof. I, I raised a question, but it, was, it wasn't read. Uh, I need more clarification uh, on the NMR versus the LCMS in the profiling the bioactive ingredients of the extracts and the fractions. So how is the profiling? Okay, so first, as I've said, we, only, we first do mass spectrometry, okay, mm. to be able to do the, the replication. The replication is when you match the metabolites with the database, okay. right? And then we do also NMR of those same crude extracts or fractions to be okay. able to validate what has been found from the database. Thank, okay. you, Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Thank you. And then you could also use the chemical shifts. You could also put them into multivariate analysis. And it will tell you which functional groups are responsible for the bioactivity. I have a couple of questions coming in from the chat. Maybe I just answer that at the moment. Uh, from Dr. Kamal, what are the metabolomic softwares that normally you use is it commercial or free okay <clears throat> they are we use metabolomic softwares that are free okay so we use mset mind that's free there's also mset much they're all free but then when it comes to multivariate analysis um, we use simca simca is not free but there's another one called uh, that's also free. Hello, okay, you're still there? Yes, yes. Yeah. We are with you. you. You are with me, yes. So Simca yes. is the other one that we use as well. But there are also some uh, free softwares available now on the web working on metabolomics. So, for example, there's uh, Metabolome 4. Um, I can't remember. But if you Google metabolomics software, there's now a lot of things available. Okay. When just using free software, you need to look at the journal papers attached to it. Okay? Because some of them could not, it's only the journal papers that will tell you that this type of software are valid or not. Another question. Hey, prof, I want to ask what you yes, mean. Sure you mean by active and inactive because see all uh, secondary metabolites when they produce by different microbes or also by uh, uh, plants when we extract it actually it's okay it's active for our purpose for for example for uh, uh, antibacterial or anti-cancer or anti but it's not uh, an um, what you said an active for our work maybe yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, like citric acid, for example. Citric yeah. acid, we can use it from spiritual snagger. We produce it a lot. They produce it for industries, for uh, they put it with the different flavor. So yeah. maybe active, but some uh, student or some researcher, they're confusing between what you said active and non active. Okay. So when we say, when we're doing, we're looking into the different extracts or fraction, fractions, we group them according to their bioactivity, whether they're active and inactive. And this activity has something to do with our screening assay. It could be yes. any screening assay that you do in any laboratory. So you could group your fractions and extract according to that bioactivity. However, when you're looking at the target metabolite, so which means you're not only looking at your extracts, from the score plot, but you need to look at the individual metabolites, okay? Some of them you will find unusual, just like this citric acid. Of course, citric acid will never be bioactive, yeah? 
But then it always came up on the bioactive side of the plot because it was responsible on the biosynthesis of secalonic acid. So every yeah. time secalonic acid is being biosynthesized, it is mirroring the production of citric acid or the other way around. Every time there's an increase in secalonic acid, then we could see the abrupt increase of citric acid as well. Okay. Thank you, Paul. So that means it becomes a biomarker. Yes. Okay, now we have also a question from Dr. Mahfoud Abdul Ghani. Yeah. Dr. Mahfoud. Okay. Could, could uh, I read another? There's another question here. Can we apply metabolomic okay. products into gen, genome editing technology in the future? The answer to that is yes. So we have some projects where we both use genomics and metabolomics. So part of the genome will be, um, what do you call this, a synthesized or mutated, and we could um, correlate that with the bioactivity as well. All right. Okay, we have one question here from this Dr. Mahfoud. He asked about the in vivo activity. Yes. Do you try it with the in vivo, for example, for this anti-cancer and also other? Uh, no, we don't. So we only apply. So what do you mean by in vivo? So um, rats, uh, mouse, rabbits? No, we don't do that. Uh, yes. because that needs a lot of ethical paperwork. So we only do cancer cell lines. Okay. Well, we could do it, I think, on cibrofish. So that will be considered in vivo. Yeah, here we have one question from uh, Rabia Al-Salami regarding the, uh, I have problem with the fermentation media, did not reach good media with a good activity. Yes, I talk. Could I talk? Yes. Yes, Rabia. Yes. Hi, Rabia. Hi, Brock. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you know, I'm already in the lab. I'm PhD student. I'm doing uh, streptomyces. Mm -hmm. So, in the beginning, I got the primary screening result. But what, when I'm doing the fermentation media, to get the secondary metabolite, I couldn't get until now. So I have to use different fermentation media and optimize the source of carbon and nitrogen or what you can advise me. Yes, I think that's the, yeah. <laughs> I know the, the problem. problem as well, yes. Yeah, you have to optimize the carbon and the nitrogen source in this case. So how yeah. did that happen? So are you telling me in the small scale, you still have, you still have bioactivity? Yeah, and the and the primary screening, yeah, I got activity, but when I use it, one of the media start with the nutrient broad, so I got activity, but it's not really good antibacterial okay. activity. What we usually do is when we are do going to scale up, we always use exactly the same media from the small scale and scale that up. If we lose the bioactivity, then it means that the um, microorganism is not stable during the scale up. Yeah. And that's when we try uh, different uh, carbon and nitrogen sources. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to use, yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. afraid for the time, you know, the fermentation media, how to optimize it to get the good activity will take long, long time. So uh, uh, that's why I'm thinking maybe there is some program to optimize or something to help me. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to say that, Rabia, but I think, yes, you need to really try every media, but then always go back to the original media where you got your bioactivity. If you could yeah. replicate that, if you could, if that is reproducible, then that is the same. That should be the media that you should be using, and you should not be trying new other, me other media. Yeah, go back yeah. to the original media where you found the bioactivity. Yep, yep, uh, yeah, I got from the nutrient broth, so I have uh, optimization, I have to optimize the nutrient broth again to enhance the activity, yeah. Yeah, your I only problem, the problem that you might encounter is the oxygen level. 
Yeah, yeah, because the oxygen level and small scale is differ, very different when you scale it up. Yeah, I hope to manage it uh, soon, inshallah. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much for reply. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Actually, actually, bro, uh, we are using the response surface methodology for optimization. Is it okay? Sorry, what are you using? Uh, RICM, response surface methodology for optimization of fermentation. Yeah, you could use as well. We have like um, so we have like an instrument where we have uh ninety six well plates, and we could then also screen the type okay. of nitrogen sources, and um, the different carbon sources. Yes, to find yeah, out yeah. what is the optimum. Yeah, I think it should be very related to that type of technique. Okay. Uh, prof, I think some uh, researchers, they are having problem for this uh, fermentation products and also growing of these microbes, especially in uh, because uh, the temperature of this microbe, they are not uh, reasonable for this, uh, for example, bacteria. So they have to adjust the pH and also that what I found it in my, for example, my research and also my student research. Yeah, that's uh, they know the pH yes. and also the temperature of these microbes. Exactly, I agree with you on that. So the um, the primary uh, optimization they do is really on pH and um, temperature. Yes, bro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do the same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question? Yeah, there is a question. How did you identify metabolites based on HNMR since it might be a single overlapping? When the overlapping, how we can identify the metabolites? Okay. If yeah, so we do use also two dimensional. So we could use then a correlation spectroscopy, COSI as well as toxic total spectroscopy. The nice thing about this is that uh, you could separate overlapping peaks. Um, another students of mine, they have been using J-Resolve instead of uh, proton NMR spectrum. So a J-Resolve will also uh, separate overlapping peaks. Hello, you're still there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you bro. <laughs> So I think that already that time already gone, bro. Yeah. Actually, before I have to do growth care before they start the optimization. You so. must do the growth care to see your bacteria when it's like uh, low phase, like phase. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yes, that's it's correct. Phase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why we always start with 7, 15, 30 days for um Fungi, but for bacteria, of course, it's shorter. So it will only be, I yeah. think, like 6, 12, 24, 48 hours is what they're using. But for actinomyces, I think same like fungi. It will take long time to grow. Yeah, fungi, they take yes. longer time to grow. Yeah, that's yes. true. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but I think they get higher uh, yield with fungi than bacteria. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Adel. Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ryan. Thank you so much, Prof. Abdullah. Uh, really, it's very go back today. We received a lot of questions. Actually, we cannot read all in the chat box because it's uh, something related, very related to our uh, field like microbiology. And actually, many of the people in pharmacy also or in uh, medical microbiology, they are looking for. Uh, some of the new products like uh, replacement for antibiotics or some things. Thank you for all participants. I think we take uh, today is a long time, uh, one hour and 15 minutes. Participants, it was so many compared with the others, alhamdulillah. Today is okay. So I have to highlight for all participants. You have to receive, you are going to receive the certificates if your attendance more than 30 minutes. So this is automatically by the Zoom website uh, software. It's not by our, by us. So please, next time you can have to come early, so to attend more than thirty minutes and above.
Thank you so much, Prof. Again, Dr. Adel. Dr. Adel, the student yeah. asked about uh, Prof. Slides if they can uh, get some uh, meaning uh, of the slides or maybe in her website or something. Okay, uh, number one, yes, Prof. Uh, Prof, uh, can you please open your mic? And mute your microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I thought it's being recorded anyway. Yes, 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 it's recorded. Yes, yes. And we already shared to Facebook and we are going to share again and upload to the YouTube in what channel. And we will, yeah. I already share our channel and uh, Facebook. Yeah, could I add something? Yes, all, the, uh, all the applications that I have presented, they have already been published. So they could also. That's great. If you want, Prof, you want to share your email for uh, others in the chat box, you can do that. Uh, if someone wants to ask you personally, I don't know. <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. How yeah. do I share that? Do yeah. I write my email on the chat box? Yes. Okay. That would be great. Yes. Do I, I need to do it now? Uh, yeah, because actually we are now at the, about to close our uh, sharing se session of today. We already, I think we already finished it. I don't know how to do it. Okay, I'll just share my. Just typing, type. Yeah, the... I'm typing, I'm typing. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a very long email. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, it's there. Okay. It. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for our participants. This is the uh, personal email. You can uh, email to her anytime. And uh, participants, they ask me for certificate. Certificate. If your attendance more than 30 minutes, so we will check, verify for the attendance, and then system will give you the certificate directly. I will share the Google Drive for all certificate and you have to go to Google Drive and find your certificate by yourself. Okay, any more questions? Thank you so much, Prof. We are uh, really happy today. We have Prof. Rowing and Prof. Abdullah. And for all- Thank you, thank you, Prof. Rowing. Thank you very much. Thank you. My Dr. pleasure. Adel. Thank you very much. Dr. Mohanna, thanks a lot to all- uh, Thank you for our, all uh, our organiz organiz yes, yes, yes. organizers. Uh, yes. We are today happy to have all of you with us and we are going to continue. I invite all of the participants to come tomorrow. We have another one very attractive uh, sharing session is about the microbiome. What's the name? Uh, what the name? Uh, cancer, oral cancer and squamous cancer. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 for the oral cancer. Yes, uh, Professor Nizar, yes. Professor Nizar, yeah. Okay, yes. thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, see you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hamad Shukri, you are welcome. Nice to meet you again. Open your uh, mic.